Stephen says, I'm Leo O'Reilly, I'm Permanent Secretary in the Department for Communities. Um, so I'm just basically here formally to welcome you to the launch of PRONI's latest exhibition, Voices and Votes, Suffrage and Representation of the People, 1832 to 1928. And of course it's also an opportunity to launch a range of interactive educational resources that have been developed for us in partnership with the Nerve Centre along with the department and PRONI. And of course, as Stephen has indicated, it's obviously appropriate that we're doing this in 2018 because the centennial of the Representation of the People Act, which was first introduced on 9th of February 2018, uh, and at that time that was an act passed to reform the electoral system in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland as it was then, which not only widened the suffrage by granting votes to women over the age of 30 who met a property qualification, but also gave the votes to all men over the age of 21, and also instituted the present system of holding general elections on a single day, and also introduced the annual election register. So an important aspect of this act was the extension of the franchise, but also it introduced other important reforms to the way democracy and elections were held in the United Kingdom. Um, this is also National Democracy Week across the UK, so if part of that we're also celebrating the progress and continued enhancement of democratic participation. And it is of course vitally important that every member of society both has an equal chance to participate in our democracy but also use their votes and have their say. Today, as Stephen has also said, it's also another important anniversary because 2nd of July also marks the anniversary of the Representation of the People Act Equal Franchise Act 1928. So this is the 90th anniversary of the extension of the franchise as a result of that act which extended universal adult suffrage in the UK was finally granted to both men and women who could vote at the age of 21. So in a sense that second act was the completion of a process of fundamental reform of the franchise that had started a decade earlier in 1918. So the launch today of, of this programme, as Stephen says, is part of a range of ongoing activities that has been sponsored by my department throughout 2018. We've already had a series of significant events, including a conference here at PRONI entitled Suffrage and Society, Then and Now, Reflections on the Representation of the People Act. There's also been a range of events and activities led, organised, to bring together female public representatives to develop skills, share experiences and consider the achievement of women in politics. It's also an opportunity to celebrate basically the enhanced participation de de delivered by these both these Acts of Parliament, but also to raise awareness generally of the benefits of full participation in public life. So our, our objectives for marking these centenary celebrations this year have been to a first of all mark the centenary Secondly, to raise in particular awareness amongst young people both of these significant historic events that we're commemorating but also more importantly to raise their awareness and to encourage their participation in democratic life and also to develop a legacy for the future by encouraging more young women into political and public life. So the, as part of this PRONI has developed this exhibition on the history of suffrage and as I said earlier has already participated with the Nerve Centre to produce the range of interactive educational suffrage resources which are also being launched today. The exhibition, and some of you may already have a chance to have a quick look at it, it explores the history of suffrage from a local perspective and this was something I must say I was not entirely conscious of the significant role played by women in this part of the world in campaigning for universal suffrage and includes some unique archival material which highlights some of the people who champion change in this part of the world and also so it therefore gives the whole history of suffrage a unique local perspective. It also I suppose gives an opportunity to showcase PRONI's archival collections and it's a tribute to the staff of PRONI have taken what is quite a complex and difficult subject and presented it in a format that can be appreciated and enjoyed by everyone. And the exhibition that's here will be here until the end of August and then it will go 
around various locations in Northern Ireland after that. So as I said earlier, we're also launching a range of interactive educational resources related to suffrage and the representation of the People Act. These resources were commissioned by the department from the Nerve Centre and developed in a partnership between Peroni and the Nerve Centre. The resources include an iBook, uh, where the Nerve Centre has reworked an existing Prony educational pack called Stand Up and Be Counted, and that relates to the suffrage movement. So this rework resource has been produced in a digital format and includes interactive timelines, video content and quiz questions, so it's particularly focused therefore on the classroom. Secondly, there's a graphic novel that has been produced by the Nerve Centre which celebrates the lives of two notable uh, champions of universal suffrage in this part of the world, Edith Lady Londonderry and Countess Constance Markievicz. And the novel, graphic novel, has been produced in such a way as it's one side is Edith Lady Londonderry and the other side is the Countess Markievicz. So both women came from arist aristocratic backgrounds, but nevertheless, both of them championed uh, suffrage, suffragette, the suffragette movement, and both were obviously significant political campaigners, albeit perhaps from a very different political perspective at the time. Um, Countess Markievicz came from Lissadell in County Sligo and would become the, actually the first woman ever to be elected to Parliament in the United Kingdom, although she never took her seats, her seat. So the novel explores the lives of both these individuals and is linked to the curriculum at Key Stage 3 and again suggests <coughs> digital tasks for the classroom. And actually the papers of both Lady <coughs> Lodenberry and Countess Markievicz can both be accessed here at Prony. So again, this is a unique uh, asset that Prony has in holding the papers of both these significant uh, people who played a significant role in the suffragette movement in this part of the world. I'm told that Nerve Centre has also produced a specially commissioned 2.5D animation charting the history of the su suffragette movement. I have to say I haven't seen a 2.5D, but I'm told that you'll be able to have the opportunity to see what an animation looks like later this morning. And finally, there's um, <coughs> we get a sneak preview of a brand new drama produced by the Kabosh Theatre Company, Edith and Constance, which features a fictional meeting between Lady Londonderry and Countess Constance Markievicz. So all these resources are aimed at educating young people. So the emphasis is very much on the service and support that Prony provides into the education system in Northern Ireland and far beyond. So it's one, one very important strand of our work here. And again, it's all about encouraging young people to engage, to become involved, and become involved in public and political life. And more generally, of course, it is particularly important to encourage young people to vote. Um, I think that's one of the most significant issues I think that democracy, certainly in the UK, faces at the moment because if young people don't vote and if it's known by political parties that they, quote, don't vote, then their views and interests will not be accorded the importance they deserve. So that's a very important additional strand of what we're doing there to here today. So therefore, I hope you'll agree that the exhibition and resources we're launching today are a fitting tribute to mark the events of 90 and 100 years ago and will build a lasting legacy by engaging young people and encouraging their participation in public and political life. Stephen has already listed some of the names of the people who've contributed to this work. I would just like generally to thank the staff here in Prony staff elsewhere in the department who are coordinating this programme of work and also of course to thank the Nerve Centre who continue to use technology and innovative ways to successfully com communicate stories and our history from a, a different perspective. So what I want to do is give a very quick um, run through of some of the um, highlights of the suffrage campaign here and it might overlap very much with some of the um, exhibits that you'll see just very quickly some of the main suffrage societies the first one of all was in the north of Ireland um, often you know the focus is on Dublin but it was the north um, and it was renamed later the Irish Women's Suffrage Society um, and I'll talk to you about the woman involved with that and then after that the Irish Women's Suffrage and Local Government Association in Dublin 
and then the militant organization that took their inspiration from the Pankhurst's um, own women's social and political union. The Pankhurst motto was deeds, not words. And this was taken up very much by young Irish women in the Irish Women's Franchise League. And then there was a suffrage federation that linked all the little groups that you'll see dotted around the place, the non-militant groups. And Dora Malone from Warren Point was the, the Northern Secretary of this. So there were about 20 Ulster groups with about 1,000 members. And the suffragettes, in response to a, a Westminster MP saying that there was very little um, uh, enthusiasm for the vote in Ireland, they constructed this suffrage map of Ireland, which at that time had a few what they call blocks on the landscape, uh, Roscommon and Longford and places that hadn't had any suffrage groups or meetings. That was later changed, but this map was done in about 1911. And you can see in the north um, lots of little groups um, and up at the top, at the northeast, more groups, and then obviously down uh, in the east around Dublin a lot as well. But there were still groups all around. You know, we had Bush Mills, uh, Newry, and all sorts of places like that that also had groups, Whitehead. Um. So Isabella Todd was uh, an Ulster Scots woman born in Edinburgh, but uh, settled in Belfast with her family. Uh, she was a unionist, uh, a very strong feminist, um, a really strong supporter of women's education, a girl's education. Um, and she conducted the first suffrage tour of Ireland with a, a friend from London. She was very well known amongst English feminists of the time. So on the 6th of February, 1873, um, they started in Belfast and went around Carrick, Fergus, Coleraine, Armagh, Dungan and Derry, ending in Dublin. And there they met... Um, the, the, the Thomas and Anna Haslam, who then later formed their own association. But this is the Irish Women's Fr Franchise League founders. You've got Hannah Sheehy um, on the left, Frank Skeffington in the middle, and then Margaret Cousins and James Cousins. Now, Hannah Sheehy, when she met Frank Skeffington and they married, they amalgamated their names to the rather difficult to say she Skeffingtons, but it was a symbol of the equality of their relationship. Hannah herself was the daughter of a Westminster MP who didn't vote in favour of women's suffrage and they had quite a strong falling out over these years. Frank Skeffington was a northerner born in Cavan but brought up in Dan Patrick. Margaret Cousins from, was from Roscommon but James Cousins her husband was a Belfast man, working class Belfast, um, educated himself, became a poet, moved down to Dublin and was part of that bohemian uh, set in Dublin. They were vegetarians, theosophists and all sorts of things. They ended up in, uh, in um, India for the rest of their lives. They left Ireland in 1913 and Margaret was actually jailed for a year in India in 1933 <coughs> as part of the women's uh, independence movement. So incredibly courageous campaigners all their lives. And this is the Franchise League banners. Um, this was the colours of the Franchise League and of the Irish suffrage movement, orange and uh, green, particularly chosen, they said, to unite the, 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 the different uh, communities. Be the cousins came from Protestant backgrounds, the she Skeffingtons from Catholic. And that's the, the difference between the Irish and British mm -hmm. colours. We're always used to the uh, green, uh, white and purple, but that actually that is the British uh, militant movement's colours. Millicent Fawcett, for example, her colours were red and green, and the other is an Irish Women's Franchise League badge. And there was great links between the British and the Irish movements because Ireland was governed by Westminster, and so any movement for change, any bill going through the House of Commons would affect British and Irish women. So when they had their big mass rallies in London, Irish women always went over. Um, so you can see here that huge rallies that they had, but you would always have had an Irish platform. So for example, in Hyde Park in 19... 10 Hennessy Skeffingtons in the middle there wearing her uh, mortarboard. Any woman who had a university degree would wear that. Um, but they were always told 
Um, they would be what they, with the British would say, you know, uh, the colonial contingent, and they were told to wear green. And one letter from uh, Hannah to her husband Frank, when she was over for this particular one, said two of the women dressed up in shawls like Colleen's. This was Christabel Pankhurst's idea. We weren't so gone on it. Um, so there was a little kind of tension between the Irish and the British movements. But there wasn't um, an Irish paper. Votes for Women was the British paper, and later on the suffragette became the British paper. And they always had information on the Irish movement until 1912, when the Irish movement decided that they needed their own paper. And you can see the Irish citizen. And its, it's strapline was very important for men and women equally, the rights of citizenship, from men and women equally, the duties of citizenship. Very much a Frank uh, Skeffington uh, conceptualization that you didn't just um, fight for rights, but you also thought what you could put into society, and that was what they were about. And it was very much a, a relation, an equal relationship. Frank and James Cousins were the editors of the Irish Citizen, leaving their wives free to be the public face, the speakers. And this is a really important mass meeting in June 1912. The Franchise League had been going for eight years by now, uh, since 1908. For four years, they'd had all the delegations, the deputations. Nothing was really happening. And you had the added complication in Ireland that a Home Rule Bill was going to be going through the House of Commons as well. And the fear was that if um, it was only men had the vote, it would be, as they said, home rule for Irish men, but not for Irish women. So they, the Irish women were fighting on two fronts. What was going to be the future of Ireland and the future of Irish citizens, and whether women would get the vote. So they had this mass meeting. 19 organisations came to it. And you can see from the Irish women's Suffrage Federation that the Belfast, Lisbon, Armagh and Newry and Warren Point branches came to it and from the Irish Women's um, Suffrage Society, the Isabella Todd organisation, there were three branches and you can see there, United Irish Women, a unanimous demand for political freedom, what is the government's answer? And it was something that united nationalist and unionist women. You can see Edith Cope here from the Armagh Suffrage Society. She said she's writing from the purely unionist point of view, but it was a principle that no democratic government could be considered complete, which ignores not only a class, but a whole sex. So women were together on, on, on this issue. And they sent their petition to um, the political parties to Prime Minister Asquith and received no reply. And it was as a consequence of this, on the 13th of June then, in 1912, that the first militant activity took place in Ireland. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, this is actually Hannah Shee Skeffington's granddaughter, Michelin. Um, she had wanted this year, in recognition of um, the representation of the People Act going through, the Dublin City Council to put a plaque on Dublin Castle, because Hannah smashed the windows of Dublin Castle, as she said, seat of British rule in Ireland. And Dublin City Council said they were very happy to do a plaque, but they suggested they also did a reenactment of the event. <laughs> and, um, and when I went there, it brought home to you, Dublin Castle is a very imposing um, building, and a small woman at five o'clock in the morning coming out to smash windows of something which was a fortress with soldiers and police there and being arrested and then serving time in jail. So eight women at that stage um, served prison sentences. The other women smashed windows in the GPO and the Customs House. So I always like to say that um, a militant activity in the GPO actually started in June 1912 with women. <laughs> And so the Irish citizen, of course, gave them fantastic coverage, Prisoners for Liberty. And that's another uh, shot. You can see what it was like. I mean, more and more women went to jail at this time, and that's Hannah st uh, standing outside um, a Mount Joy jail, speaking to the crowd and, and using the megaphone. And, you know, it was a difficult time because they were seen not only as rebels as women, said Hannah, but also as enemies of home rule because they were now really um, uh, 
protesting against the government and they were also protesting against the Irish Parliamentary Party because the Irish Parliamentary Party, wanting home rule, decided to vote against all women's suffrage bills going through Westminster. And in fact, the last bill that would have, would have um, given some women the vote in 1912 was defeated by the votes of the Irish Party. The Irish Party held the balance of power it's a bit like the DUP today. The Irish Party then, the Liberal government was a minority government and it decided it wanted home rule and it didn't want parliamentary time eaten up by you know, votes for women. So the, the parliamentary party, the Irish party killed the conciliation bill was the cry of both the British and the Irish suffragists. And here's um, Meg Connery from the Franchise League still trying to find out what is going to happen to the future of Ireland. Um, is it going to be home rule? Are women going to have the vote? And another issue is Ulster was saying that it was going to opt out of home rule. And so she, uh, Sir Edward Carson on the right and Bonner Law, the head of the Conservatives, were meeting together in Dublin and she and Hannah went to give them leaflets to ask them those questions. And Hannah actually got arrested. Um, men were at this stage so jumpy about seeing men, women at all. Women were uh, barred from all public meetings, couldn't physically get to talk to any politicians anymore. They just decided they weren't going to talk to them. And Hannah got a week in jail um, as a result, was told that she had assaulted you know, a six foot four policeman. Um, <laughs> So there was one uh, amend a private member's amendment to the Home Rule Bill by the Labour MP Philip Snowden, which would have, which was to say that women should have the vote in the Home Rule Bill, and this was defeated again by the votes of the Irish Party. And that was the first Ulster militancy then that women smashed uh, windows in the post office in Donegal Place, cut telephone wires, and attacked pillar boxes. Um, nobody got arrested. I mean, it wasn't necessary. Uh, you could do things in a sneak way and not get arrested. And I think some of the women who maybe had children didn't want to get arrested. But this is the, the kind of image that they had now. John Redmond was the leader of the Irish party, and this was the cartoon <laughs> that the, other, the citizen had. Hooray for liberty, no Irish woman needs apply, no votes for women by order of the new liberator standing on the prostrate <laughs> body of a suffragette. And... Meetings continued, for example, Ormo Park was allowed by the big, uh, Belfast Corporation to have uh, one suffrage meeting a year, and Mrs Chambers talking about um, part of her speech, a woman's competence to perform a suffrage <coughs> operation, because women by this stage could be doctors, they still couldn't be lawyers, which is why Christabel Pankhurst, who had a law degree, couldn't practice, so devoted her strategic abilities to conducting the suffrage campaign. But... Um, if it were women's work to fit the children to go into the world, it was equally important to see the world was a fit place for their children. And they always made the point that the, the vote wasn't an abstract thing. It was a, is it a weapon in order to change society from this man-made society and make it something fit for women, children and everybody. Margaret McCoubrey is one of the, the best known militants. She didn't go to jail, I think because she had two small children. And there's a plaque um, outside her home in Kandahar Street off the Orma Road. Her daughter wrote very nice um, reminiscences about uh, growing up with her mother who was a suffragette, who was you know, quite well known at the time. And she made this point that when women came over from England as part of the arson campaign, that they would hide their um, fire lighters in, in the cake boxes and how they always had these cakes for tea when, when, when they had visitors staying with them and what it was like that her mother you know, was always under police surveillance <coughs> and how they tried to embarrass the detectives by going to underwear departments or uh, things like that. So um, it was another kind of slant on uh, the life of a, of a militant. Um, Elizabeth Bell was one of the members of the Irish Women's Suffrage Society. She was the first woman in Ireland to qualify for a doc as a doctor. She was imprisoned in Holloway Jail with Margaret Robinson, her friend, who ran a women's school, in, uh, a girls' school in Whitehead. And she later was adopted to the suffragettes in Crumlin Road. So there were 18 women from Ireland served time in Holloway Jail because of those links 
Um, Margaret Cousins, for example, spent a summer holiday in London, as she said, learning the, the, as apprenticeship to become a militant suffragette and took part and served a two-month sentence in Holloway. Lilia Metcher, who um, founded the Lisburn Suffrage Society, was um, a widow of a, an MP, a very respectable woman. At this stage, she was president of Lisburn Golf Club. And she was over in London, at, this is at the uh, a deputation to try to see the king. And she, uh, Lillian's the, uh, the tall woman with the, the hat with the thing on it. And she saw women not only being arrested, but very badly treated. And she said from that moment on, she became a militant and was indeed a militant. Um, uh, she became the WSPU, Christabel Panker set up an Ulster Centre in Belfast and all the um, art of the Belfast suffragists joined it, so there was a Belfast WSPU here. And the reason they came to Belfast was that the Ulster Unionists were saying that they were um, going to opt out of Home Rule and set up a provisional Ulster, Ulster uh, government. And at one point they said, and if that happened, they would give women the vote. And this caused huge surprise by everybody because up to this point, the Ulster Unionists were anti-suffrage at least Sir Edward Carson, very, very strongly so. Um, but he then reneged on that promise, which was worse than never having given it in the first place. So the Ulster uh, Unionists, the, the WSPU said that they would declare war on the Ulster Unionists. <coughs> and this is some of the activities they did. They burned down Abbey Land's mansion, where they, uh, which had very extensive grounds, and the UVF were uh, drilling there. They, they burnt down Newtonard's race stand, golf courses, bowling, uh, places. Um, you can see that there were places of male leisure pursuit, mm -hmm. but they also bur burnt uh, or attacked things like the Old Town Hall, which was the Ulster Union's headquarters, um, churches, and famously then Lisbon Cathedral, because they saw the church being linked to the establishment. And um, Abbey Land was really quite a shock. That, that's a picture of, of it after the arson attempt. Um, and, and they always left messages, and those are some of the messages that, that, that they left. And they were always trying to say that there's a distinction. Sir Edward Carson threatens to destroy life, women only destroy property. Um, Christabel uh, produced this uh, leaflet making the distinction between the fact that the government was allowing the Ulster Unionists to run guns into Ulster, but they were um, bringing suffragettes to court. They weren't doing anything about the Ulster the men, but they were persecuting women in Ulster. And so this is a, a, a photo that I have shamelessly stolen from Prony, and um, a, a newspaper photo. And there is Dorothy Evans, who was the main organizer that Christabel sent over to Belfast, and you can see her in handcuffs in the court, um, and women in, in, in hats then acting as court reporters. One of the things that happened was that the women would not um, uh, agree with the court. It was an all-male all uh, institution. Dorothy Evans made the point that she would agree to be tried by a jury of her peers, but all men were not her peers, and therefore um, she would throw things at the judge, refused to sit down, refused to listen, and was eventually, as you can see, handcuffed, tried to keep her quiet. The women themselves would make huge fury in the, in the court. Um, Lillian Metcher went out and smashed the court windows as one of the cases was being heard and was arrested herself. So the women were only let in on, on the guarantee that they were there to re report proceedings, which is why you can see them writing. And at this stage, in order to stop women um, simply going on hunger strike and then being forcibly fed, which is what had happened in England, which had given huge um, uh, public sympathy to the suffrage movement. The government had produced uh, the Prisoners Temporary Discharge for Ill Health Act, which the suffragettes called the Cat and Mouse Act. <laughs> what happened was when you went on hunger strike and got weak, you were released from prison till you recovered your strength and you were supposed to then go back 
uh, to the prison and continue to serve your sentence. And of course, nobody ever uh, went back to serve their sentence. So what Dorothy Evans and Madge Muir, two of the um, English organisers, did was they hired a car and put all the suffrage flags on it and drove around Belfast city centre until uh, being re uh, re-arrested. And so they were in and out of jail um, all the time, refusing to, to accept or comply with any kind of regulations. Uh, Lilia Metcher herself went to the offices of two um, journalists here, um, two editors of newspapers, <coughs> stormed into their offices and whipped them with her horsewhip because of the kinds of coverage that they had given her. She was a, a very formidable woman. Um, and it was her, Dorothy Evans, a woman called Dorothy Carson, who wasn't a relative of Sir Edward, um, and another woman, four of them went and tried to blow out the windows of Lisbon uh, Cathedral and were arrested and um, were in Crumlin Road Jail at the time that the First World War started. So they ended up not serving the sentence and being released as suffragettes were released um, and a lot of them went on to, to engage in war work. So those are the women who were in Belfast Jail. Mabel Small, who was a teacher of Belfast Tech, was given two months hard labour for breaking one window in the Ulster Unionist headquarters. So you can see that the, the penalties were severe um, when, when they were uh, given sentences. I'm going to skip on very quickly now. Um, obviously women were involved in war work and you had people like um, Edith Lady London <coughs> uh, with the Women's Legion, but in, in Ireland we had the proclamation of the Republic the um, promise of equal rights and equal opportunities and equal suffrage. You had Constance Markovic being involved. There she is going to prison and being released from prison. And then while the war was still on, you had Parliament discussing what to do about the franchise. And it was really about what to do about the men serving in the trenches um, and giving them the vote um, because they knew that they had to call an election um, at some stage, there hadn't been one since the war had started. And women came involved in that discussion, but they weren't the primary um, objective. And eventually, because so many men had died in the trenches, they didn't want it to be uh, dominated by women, and therefore they put the um, age restriction there, um, and also the property restriction. They wanted to make sure that women who were an unknown breed, everyone thought they would either be very conservative or re very radical, depending on what political party you came from. So they wanted to neutralise women. And then in November, you also had the Parliament Qualification of Women Act, so you could stand as a candidate. So if you were 21, you could stand for Parliament, but you couldn't actually vote for yourself if you were a woman. And indeed, this happened uh, to quite a lot of women um, who stood before the age of 30. And Sinn Féin, because it had had that promise of equality, put up two women candidates. So you had Winifred Carney, who had served in the GPO. She, had, she was a trade union organiser in Belfast, worked for the linen workers. She had also spent the entire time in the GPO with James Connolly, with her typewriter and her Webley. And this is part of her election manifesto, standing for the People's Republic, the Workers' Republic of the whole Irish people. A very radical <coughs> manifesto. Um, wasn't the ordinary Sinn Féin manifesto, in which no idle rich class shall exploit men and women and children and grow fat and wealthy upon the sweat and blood and labour of the working class. Now, her constituency, the Victoria Ward, um, was a working class constituency, but very much unionist, so it was a, a unionist Labour candidate won, and Winifred only got 395 votes. Um, but you did have Constance Martin standing in Dublin, and in fact, Sinn Féin weren't particularly keen on organising for her. It was the women of Cumberland and the women of the Franchise League who came together, because she was again back in jail. She was in Holloway Jail at this time. Um, and the Irish citizen, which was still uh, in existence, had an editorial about it because women stood in Britain as well, um, and none of them got elected, not even Christabel Pankhurst. Um, Ireland was the only one to elect anyone. So Ireland leads the way, and while Britain wallows in reaction and turns her back on women MPs, Ireland proudly writes progress on her banner to show the world how much in advance she is of those who would rule her. And then, as you see, 
equal franchise in the Irish Free State in 1922. Each person should enjoy the privileges without distinction of sex. And um, 1928 in uh, Northern Ireland, England, Scotland and Wales. Okay, thank you. Um, so how do I basically um, follow a leading authority on suffrage and women's rights in Ireland? Well, I'll give it my best shot and hopefully you'll be kind to me. I would encourage heckling. No <laughs> stones near the windows, please. Um, but some heckling, of course, because I'm going to quote from the archives specifically. And of course, they're not necessarily my own thoughts. They're direct from the archives themselves. I have a few rough notes, and the chair is very kind to give me four hours. <laughs> oh, sorry, 40 minutes. Uh, but I'll give it my best shot. So a few contextual points I'd like to make, um, just to put in context. Um, but I'd like to emphasise maybe in how the exhibition was put together, how it was approached. Highlight some of the content that I'm interested in. Um, and then a note on collaboration towards the end. So we'll give it a go. So if the chair drags me through the door, and about 40 minutes later you know my time is up. So, it has been a privilege um, to work on exploring suffrage over the last six months. And for me, the history of suffrage is very relevant to understanding how our own voting rights have developed, um, especially as this part of the world um, had a unique part of the <coughs> struggle for um, equal representation through votes. So the Voices and Votes exhibition launched today explores that pursuit of suffrage from that local perspective, particularly the struggle for women's representation and the people who champion change, both men and women. So it is a story of men and women, both men's suffrage and women's suffrage, and men and women champion change and repre change and representation. So as the speakers this morning have already highlighted, today marks the 90 year anniversary of equal voting rights being approved in the UK. So with this anniversary in mind, and indeed last February the 6th, um, the 100 year of the Representation of the People Act to the Fourth Reform, the main aims of the exhibition are to highlight this long struggle for equal rights to political voice through votes, and acknowledging today as the first day of the National Democracy Week and the exhibition also encourages young adults to have their say and indeed a QR code directly into the exhibition and um, helps people scan and sign up to vote as they stand in the Prony Atrium um, at the exhibition. So our local story straddles two centuries so I like to push back and have a wider view and prior to 1832, the franchise was based on male freeholders who owned a rented property generating an income of 40 shillings, around two pounds or more per year. And that's around 2,400 pounds in today's money. It was later increased to 10 pounds in 1829. Um, and that drastically reduced the electorate in Ireland, reduced the men with the right to vote. So the Representation of the People Act 1832, or the Great Reform Act, was the first major change to the electoral system across Britain and Ireland in around 400 years. New categories of property-based franchise was created, including provision for some leaseholders, which widened um, the male-only franchise and increased the overall electorate by around 19%. For me, though, of course, you'd expect me to go back directly to the archives themselves, because those original sources contribute to our knowledge of such extensions, and indeed the manhood suffrage, um, including the earliest document displayed in the exhibition outside. Um, it is basically a declaration from the independent electors of Belfast, an anticipation of the 1832 election and those electors issued this declaration and they issued it for the first time in support of their local candidates. And it states, to interest to me, and I'm going to read out um, 
were their views on the objects of political effort in 1832. It's up to you to see if they're relevant um, or operational today. The first one is to calm public excitement. <laughs> and the second one is to soothe acrimonious feelings. And the third is to promote those measures of practical improvement which have been too long unhappily postponed. And the declaration itself is signed. And as you can see there, it's, it's signed on one side of the page and then down the other by quite a number of local individuals. And just three randomly picked out from that are James Gibson, Thomas Corbett and Israel Milliken. So a lot of um, Presbyterians, etc., signing for the first time um, and achieving um, a declaration and as an elector. None of the candidates publicly declared for these electors, though, <coughs> and through this instrument secured a seat. The corporation candidate, Lord Arthur Chichester, and a plus James Emerson Tennant were returned to represent the borough of Belfast at Westminster in 1832. So leaping forward then to 1916, the House of Commons recognised that a forthcoming general election could not use the pre-war electoral register as many of the men currently on military service would have been excluded due to non-residency. So a conference on electoral reform was established in October 1916, later recommending the franchise be conferred on all adult men even if they were absent from their residence. Limited suffrage was also suggested for women, where they or their husbands were in the local government register. The recommendation went forward in a bill, and it was introduced to the House of Commons on the 19th of May, 1917. Later leading to the fourth reform of the Representation of the People Act, finally approved on the 6th of February, 1918, where all men over the age of 21 could now vote um, in parliamentary elections as long as they were resident in the consistency and were not disqualified from voting, such as in prison, etc. Women over 30 years old could register for a parliamentary vote as long as they or their husband qualified for that local government um, vote specified in the recommendation. But also, there were special provisions made for men serving in the armed forces, those who could register as absent voters from the age of 19. Women serving during the war were also covered by the provisions, however they could not vote until they were over 30 years old. And munition workers, who were technically working for the war effort, were not included in the classification. So it would take a further 10 years then after that for both men and women who were granted universal suffrage in the UK and um, the anniversary today. So happy Equal Franchise Day. So the question, after all that boring context that I have read mm -hmm. out to you, and um, the question really that I had to ask myself in putting the exhibition together is why did representation change in 1918? Um, secondary to that, and um, what do the contemporary records, just behind the walls here, in the vaults, in the Prony repository and stores, um, from 1832 to 1918, reveal about the suffrage story, and to let them speak for themselves. So the exhibition launch today um, tries to help you explore that question, um, especially from the local perspective. So I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about how the exhibition was approached um, and to showcase some of the originals. And I hope you will look around the exhibition during lunch later today and ask me questions and my colleagues questions. And um, you can think of at least one question to ask a Prony member of staff um, before you leave today. And enjoy the exhibition um, for the amount of information on local um, records is within it. So the selection process was ruthless. Um, as you can see there's an extensive display in the atrium and um, there's 10 <coughs> sides of exhibition panels 
Um, but just to put it in context, there is a wealth of documents relating to um, suffrage and representation of that period within the collections. I personally looked at around 425 prony records and they were consulted of which only 37 made their way into the exhibition, including minute books, um, court files, electoral registers, photographs, private correspondence, you can see there pamphlets, newspapers, drawings, caricatures, etc. all make their way into the exhibition. And there's a small discreet case just before you walk in through the doors into this room where I've placed a few of the documents that didn't make their way into the exhibition. And they're very strong documents um, relating both to Edith Lady Londonderry and um, to Constance Markovich and indeed to other individuals, ladies in the workplace, and indeed a very interesting little hymn sheet um, relating to the funeral of Emmeline Pankhurst, um, in which um, Charlotte Despard attended, and indeed that makes its way into the collections. So have a look at those as well as you wander around with your, your tea, coffee and sandwiches. So the original records identify prominent people and significant organisations. And indeed, the structure that it takes, it reflects upon three specific themes. The first one is gender, the second one is class, and the third one is political perspectives. And they're all very significant for this local area. All sources are presented chronologically um, from um, basically 1832 to 1928, which very much reflects the 96-year struggle for change from the Great Reform Act to the Equal Franchise Act. And indeed, like any historical theme, it has no start or end. Um, it just continues and transforms um, today. So prony sources are also supported by a further 12 images from major collections in Britain and Ireland, such as the Women's Library at London School of Economics, the National Library of Ireland, and from private individuals as well. And at the very back of the exhibition, when you look down the floor, you'll see a suffrage map. And I like that because it brings the local people and the local places into one panel where the local people are listed, the place is significant. Margaret eloquently showed the, the suffrage map of Ireland and it gives some details um, relating to um, those specific meetings um, and suffragette attack sites. But the images that stood out for me um, in the selection process I'm keen to show you on the screen today. They're all already hinted at. Um, you can see here if this pointer works, I'm not sure if it does. Um, on the left you have a beautiful image of Miss Isabella Todd around 1890 regarded as one of the most prominent feminists of the 19th century, Scottish born, settled in Belfast, and for me personally, a very significant lady indeed in her role with the Contagious and Diseases Act, working for the rights of those labelled by officials incorrectly as very often prostitutes. Her role in championing women and their enfranchisement in Belfast, which is the second one there, the tally rooms at Belfast Courthouse in 1894. Indeed, it was her and others that championed Belfast to be the first to include women in the local elections at that time. So this is the tally rooms relating to the election of 1894 and the Belfast local election. And whilst women could vote at the election, candidacy remained exclusively male and in this borough um, specifically um, Jaffa was, was elected at that period. The one underneath and this is one I want everyone to start debating about outside is a photograph of Straban, a demonstration in Straban around 1910 accepted by most as a parody of the suffragists and their political aspirations but I think we should be open-minded 
and look for other sources to support this. Um, and there's another photograph that accompanies this, I think, that speaks even more to the story than this one. And they're two side by side in the exhibition outside. And with personal thanks to Dr. Sheena Mary Ray, who's in the audience today, a private individual who very kindly let us use family documents relating to suffrage. This is a certificate signed by Pankhurst, Pathic Lawrence of the Women's Social and Political Union, it was awarded to Dr. Elizabeth Gold Bell in 1912 for her courage in enduring a long period of solitary and confinement in prison for the votes for women cause. And again, her story is incorporated into the exhibition. For me personally though, setting out the thing that stood out for me are the words of several individuals whose voices preserved through the original archives held in Crony's care. And I think they are very key, a key feature to the exhibition. And indeed they're highlighted in bold turquoise text. The exact words um, written at the time um, there within the exhibition. I'd like to read a few of the words if that's okay. Six distinct individuals, three men and three women. And I'm very disappointed you're not tackling so far. Mm -hmm. So this will maybe give you an opportunity to do so. Really, I want to read their direct words. I want to bring their voice to the event today to help us reflect on the various opinions and suffrage and representation conveyed in the exhibition. And as I did say, and warn you that they're not necessarily my own. So no bricks with little messages wrapped around thrown towards the, the speaker today, please. Um, so let's, let's give it a go. I'd be keen though afterwards to hear what you think of some of the voices that are there. So the first one is John Stuart Mill, okay? 1869 feminist writer, civil servant, after the death of his wife and to carry on very much the thoughts of the, the couple, he published an essay, The Subjection of Women, a copy of which can be found within the papers of Jeremiah Jordan, MP within Prony, and um, representative, I think, for South Fermanagh off the top of my head. He writes, the legal subordination of one sex to another is wrong in itself and now one of the chief hindrances to human improvement, and that it ought to be replaced by a system of perfect equality, admitting no power and privilege on the one side, nor disability on the other. There remains no legal slaves, save the mistress of every house. Okay, I'm not going to give any interpretation, but I'll be keen to hear afterwards what you think of these views very much competing views. The second one I think is, I've been told, it's an odd choice when you're searching for the voices on suffrage, and it's that of an individual called Marianne, 1865. She was admitted to the Belfast workhouse five times with her two daughters, each time remaining for several days. In total they spent 20, 25 nights out of 31 in the workhouse, and the workhouse officials record Marianne's occupation as prostitute. Okay, there is no evidence, we've done a little bit of searching around, there's no evidence that Marianne was a prostitute, however that label would transform her experience in the workhouse. And most women who had no obvious occupation at this time, or had illegitimate children, were classed as prostitutes by the official bodies. And indeed she has no voice. So I could do a Lethwick um, like in England and stand up for seven minutes and say absolutely nothing and convey the voice that Marianne had. So that voice is absent. But we can get a little bit of a, an idea of her experiences from the Minute Book of Ballymena Board of Guardians, which reveals the experience of such a silent voice in the workhouse. And it just states, by 1848, it was resolved that females admitted labouring under venereal disease, common prostitutes, or women who have each more than one bastard child be separately classed in the ward over the idiot ward. Inmates in this ward 
are not to go into the dining hall at meals, not to attend divine service, but to be supplied with prayer books and testaments. So I think that voice speaks for themselves. The third one, another gentleman, and you can compare this with um, Mill. In 1884, during debates in the House of Commons in the third Irish Home Rule Bill, Liberal politician Sir jo Joseph Peace voiced his traditional views. In announcing that, this is where you might want to heckle both gentlemen and ladies, women is endowed with a most delicate organisation which sways the whole course of her life. It influences her actions and her mode of thought, and its effect is to make mankind afford her protection rather than turn her adrift in the vortex of political life. Nothing more said. The fourth voice is a very strong lady, Agnes Sunley, and she, within the archive, has written to the Lord Chancellor of Ireland in 1884. She puts it, I think, very eloquently across her views and the views of most suffragists um, in Britain and Ireland. She says that the future reforms should be extended to women as they are entirely unrepresented, not one woman being allowed to vote, although they discharge the same duty to the state. I know many women who are working very hard to get a living for themselves and their children and pay just the same amount of rates and taxes as men, and yet they are not considered good enough to vote. Suddenly developed a very high profile as a champion for <coughs> female um, votes by lobbying MPs and successive Prime Ministers, including Asquith himself, who ardently opposed women's suffrage. And he himself stated on the 6th of May 1913, I am sometimes tempted to think, as one listens to the arguments of supporters of women's suffrage, that there is nothing to be said for it. And I am sometimes tempted to think, as I listen to the arguments of the opponents of women's suffrage, that there is nothing to be said against it. So it was a battle for those that are champion suffrage. One of my favourite individuals, already mentioned by Dr Ward in her presentation, is Mabel Small, and she gets most of a panel within the exhibition. And the census return for 1911 reveals the civil disobedience of Mabel as a suffragette and her fellow com com campaigner. And the numerator notes the following. Mabel Small, information refused. About 37, teacher of sewing at Municipal Technical Institute, born in England, accompanied by Morris, information refused. About 43, born in England, note about were all the particulars which could be ascertained regarding these women. They stated that they are militant suffragettes and refused to give any information to the census of Ireland. So Mabel had a loud and public voice, very much opposite to that of Marianne, and indeed she was an active suffragette. A newspaper article regarding an attack on the old town hall Belfast in 1914, which was the headquarters of the Ulster Unionists at the time, states that a young woman named Mabel Small appeared in the dock wearing a green costume and carrying a bunch of daffodils. She is accused of maliciously damaging the window. During her hearing, she called out, Did you find anything on me? In response, the arresting constable replied, In your bag were four half bricks. <laughs> she, she was maybe up to something. Uh, from an archival point of view, though, there's three really treasures, three letters from a file created by the Belfast College of Technology, her employers, which reveal the confidence with which she spoke herself. So to the principal in April 1914 she wrote, as you will probably have seen an account in the papers of my arrest and imprisonment, I beg to inform you that after four days hunger and thirst strike, I have been released under the Cat and Mouse Act, 
and shall be at my duties at the Technical Institute on Monday as usual. <laughs> in acknowledgement of her letter, the Institute replied, and this is quite, quite an interesting one, I put it to you that it is an understanding in this place that everyone is, is required to abstain from propaganda work and give their whole energy to the work of their institute. As far as possible, staff are expected to use the holidays for regeneration of their efforts <laughs> so that they may return to their work with full vigour. So I don't think anyone can, can say that she hadn't full vigour. In response, Mabel clarified her position. She continued to correspond with the authorities, her employers, and she says, my promise to refrain from militancy applied only to the term and that I reserved the right to do as I pleased with my holidays. So the final voice, the sixth one that I want to point out, and there are several in the exhibition to enjoy, um, is one which represents where the suffragette movement attracted criticism and resistance, <coughs> and there are several, but this is the one that I thought was interesting, because it brings the local story um, to light, basically, in the context of what was happening in England. And it's a letter to his mother from Captain um, Alexander, an army officer um, from County Tyrone. And he writes to his mother on the 5th of June, 1913. We went over to see the Derby. There was a bad scene when the wretched suffragette caught the king's horse and nearly killed his jockey. I wish the woman had been given to the crowd it would have stopped suffragettes. She is badly hurt. I enjoyed the day awfully. <laughs> <laughs> of course, he was referring to the prominent suffragette Emily um, Davison, who later died of her injuries um, a few days later. Um, and indeed, some of the ladies represented in the archive went to her funeral, where they, there was thousands, um, according to Charlotte Despard's diaries, marching in green and white. Now reactions to two documents I think is key and I want to just show the two documents to you. And they've been alluded to by the previous speakers but I think it brings the local aspect um, to us. There are reactions to two proclamations made by political leaders in Ireland, one unionist and one nationalist. And they both play a unique part in the suffrage story influencing and the result across Britain and Ireland, in my view. So the first one on the left um, is the Ulster Provisional Government Proclamation, issued in 1913. And as the Home Rule debate escalated in the 1910s, Ulster Unionist leaders were preparing for an alternative Ulster government should Home Rule come into force in Ireland. The leadership was divided on the question of votes for women, and to prevent that open disagreement, basically, within the community at the time, um, the Ulster Unionist Council decided to grant women the vote in any future elected assembly. And a copy of the letter that was issued is in the exhibition. But indeed, when this Ulster Provisional Government Proclamation was finally issued on the 24th of September 1913, it made no reference to women, reneging on their original pledge through that um, Ulster Women's Charter. It prompted the establishment of a Belfast branch of the Women's Social and Political Union, with many of the suffragettes coming from Scotland and England, some of them actually paid um, to do so, to embark on a militant campaign in this part of the world for around six months. And indeed Margaret showed Abbey Lands, etc. Um, and there's quite a few um, activities in which they did in both protests, and meetings, and attacks. In contrast, on the right, in 1916, the Easter Rising took place in April of that year, predominantly in Dublin. Numerous women were prominent during the Rising, mostly as nurses and messengers, with a few actually taking part in combat, including Constance Markovich herself, whose papers we hold as part of the Lissadell collection. So the close links with female supporters and activists led to an explicit inclusion of women's citizenship in the 1916 proclamation of the Irish Republic. 
and in addressing both Irish men and Irish women, revolutionary leaders recognised them on an equal basis in the formation of a new Irish Republic. So they're very, you can compare the strategies together. Promises of the equal rights from the 1916 proclamation were embraced in the 1922 constitution, proving to be the first British legislation to grant a vote for women on an equal basis with men, albeit restricted to the new Irish free state. In the UK, it would take a further six years before universal suffrage was achieved. So what impact do the voices have? And I think they reveal something of the experiences of women and the advocacy of men during the 96 year struggle for equal franchise. And they remain in the archive to be heard today. So John Stuart Mill published feminist commentary on women and the vote, arguing that having half the human race unable to contribute to society outside the home was a hindrance to human development. His writings circulated widely. And of course he was responsible for presenting a um, petition to Parliament. Working class women such as Marianne were silenced with official labels until suffragists such as Isabella Todd actively campaigned against what Todd has quoted, the men who devised such legislation. And Marianne's personal experiences, so quiet at the time, are being revealed through the Prony Archives 100 years on. And finally, the personal stories such as those of Mabel Small survive in the archive today as an active voice for equal rights. So I'd like now to turn a few comments on how the exhibits are presented. Okay. There's several layers um, of information which reflects the various interests and knowledge of visitors. You don't have to read it from start to finish to learn something new. You can dip in and out of the Pacific aspects because it incorporates images, narrative, highlights and quick response links in whatever way you want to explore the period and indeed return and explore another aspect of the exhibition on a future visit. So the viewer may approach the exhibition by enjoying it as a learning resource and the storyboard approach or just by selecting those elements that build upon or challenges knowledge and um, required elsewhere. The narrative runs throughout the exhibition and includes early experiences, the suffragists campaign, local suffragette activities, women during the First World War and the final steps made towards equal franchise. Um, the direct quotes are interesting to me. If I was coming in, I would look at the images, the direct quotes, and then work my way through the exhibition. But that's just personal in the way that you want to approach. So you don't need to read it from start to finish to discover something new. Highlight boxes are used to focus on significant people or relevant pieces of legislation and provide an additional level of information or context not fundamental to understanding the narrative. And the images to me stand out. They showcase some of the unique archives and collections relating to the people, places and events relevant to the local suffrage story and can be enjoyed as a standalone entity. And finally, QR codes are incorporated to encourage young adults to have their say, including one which can be scanned and directly registered to vote standing in front of the exhibition. Some of the other sources which I have to show you, um, one specifically which we're very proud of and working very closely with the developer in Spatial is the Prony Suffrage Map. And fingers crossed that it works. I think my tab has disappeared. The, the application explores some of the documented suffragette activities which took place locally, including rallies, protests and attacks on property and how these events were reflected in the press. So it's a nice marriage between the contemporary language of the newspapers of the day and information on the individuals and places. They've all been identified using the British newspaper archive which can be accessed free of charge and prony. 
And I have to acknowledge the work, I think Aidan Highlands here today, in the early days of developing and identifying some of the key information. You can follow the circular tabs at the top to read about each event and the places where they happened. And all maps are interactive and date to the time um, of each event. But for me, the language used to describe the suffrage activities in the newspapers stand out in this application. <coughs> and there's a little bit about suffrage. And my favourite is the map itself, all populated there with the acts of the vote. Um, significant sites and there will always be one close to you that you were not aware of. The application introduces contemporary and sometimes competing attitudes um, for you to interpret of the period and they can create more questions than answers. Now I want to try the third tab. Let's see, it's working perfectly. It's just loading up there we are. So the, the second tab basically is titled General Post Office, Donegal Square, Belfast. You can click, right click on the axe specifically. And there it will give the information on the tab that's relevant to it. You can also pan out and scroll around to the local areas relating to the map, as you can see there. And key pieces of information of interest just under on the tab here. But for me, I rather like the marriage between the map um, and indeed the newspaper content. So this first one was recorded the Militant Act by suffragettes in Ulster occurred in 1912 when suffragettes smashed the windows of the General Post Office in Donegal Square. The suffragette newspaper record, reported, as you can see there, an extensive report of the activity. And just to read from the words themselves, the gaping window still remains a mute testament, testament to the de desperate valour which has no doubt struck terror into the hearts of all. So you have the views there of the suffragette on that activity, reporting on the 15th of November 1912. The next tab, I'm not going to go through them all, you'll be thankful. I'm sure my time's running out. The next tab um, relates to lively suffragette meeting in Belfast, Ulster Hall. Um, in May 1914, a large number of, oh sorry, the suffragettes Ulster Hall, March 1914, protest against Miss Pankhurst in London being arrested. And in this case, the Scotsman newspaper reported on a lively <coughs> meeting in Belfast. And if anyone can interpret what this is, or give some information, this was very intriguing to me personally. Because they stated that electric snuff and evil smelling bombs were utilised to discomfort the speakers. So I'm hopeful that that strategy isn't adopted today for the rest of the speakers, because I'm told they're extremely, extremely good, and the audience shouldn't do such things. Um, but whatever electric snuff may be, I would love to find out um, an evil smelling bones. The last tab I want to show you, and indeed you can scan the QR code outside in the exhibition and play around with this during lunch and have a, a, a look through the tabs. This last tab I wanted to show you is in May 1914 a large number of holes were cut on the greens at Knock Golf Links. <laughs> Messages were written on postcards and were pinned to small pegs stuck in the ground. And one inscription stated, be sporting and give equal sporting chances all round. <laughs> the editor of the Belfast Weekly News though described the suffragettes methods um, on these immaculate greens as following, where the object of further mutilating the velvety sward, the use of weed killer was resorted to. So it just brings that beautiful language um, into a modern format today. Now, my final comment you'll be glad to, to hear, and I want many discussions out in the exhibition after the, the speakers are over, but my final comment at the front has to refer to the level level of, of collaboration. 
I can get back to my slides. Um, the level of collaboration this exhibition has warranted. Um, Prony had the pleasure, myself and my colleague Ronya Lockram, very much had the pleasure of working with archival materials sourced from around 15 collections, most of them from the major collection of Prony itself. Five private depositors, one private family member, and collaborating with staff from five external organisations to realise um, the exhibit and the suite. So if the exhibition isn't enough, several educational resources can be easily accessed from your mobile device using the QR code incorporated into the final panel and will be showcased um, after the comfort break this morning. The exhibition will be on display at Prony until the end of August and will tour other institutions and libraries over the coming months. So watch out on the Prony Facebook pages for news on where the exhibition is being displayed. Um, thank you for not heckling, not throwing stones or messages, and very much thank you for listening. So hopefully you enjoy the rest of your day. to be here. Um, as Stephen says, my name is Niall Kerr. I'm a project manager with the Nerve Centre. And the Nerve Centre is a, for those who don't know, is North Ireland's sort of leading creative media arts centre um, based in Derry, based in Belfast. Um, and you might wonder why a creative media arts centre are involved in um, standing here talking to you about suffrage today um, or, or anything to do with the decades and theories, but Really, the Nerve Centre has taken quite a strong lead um, sort of since the early 1990s around issues of community relations and cultural diversity and trying to, to bring new ways of learning around uh, significant periods of our history, everything from the decades and centenaries to the troubles uh, and even events before that. And we've done it in our, in our slant, in our way, by trying to use creativity, the arts, digital methods where possible to, to, to bring a new lease of life and to allow primarily young people uh, who, who wouldn't otherwise engage with this content, allow them to do so in a way that, that makes it relevant and appealing to them. So in recent years we've developed a platform called Creative Centenaries. Um, Creative Centenaries uh, started out as an initiative funded by the then Department of Culture, Arts and Leisure, uh, now Department of Communities, as a home and a bit of a hub platform for the decades and theories in, in Northern Ireland and trying to, to correlate and bring all the, the kind of resource, information, uh, and news and events about the decades and theories, uh, bring them to one place that people can access it easily uh, and readily. And over that time um, we've, we've started to develop new ways of engagement uh, and new ways of learning and uh, bringing the decades and theories as we know is, is quite a quite a, a, a vast period of time, it was 10 years, but it's, it's, it's vast in, in terms of its um, complexities and uh, of the events that took, took part within that time frame. And so we tried to, to bring, a, a, bring about a, a way of change, a, a new way of thinking, as I said, primarily for, for new audiences and for new young people to, to interact and, and engage with it. And delighted to be able to work with the Department for Communities this year and also quite closely with, with Prony here around a new project. Um, every year, sort of throughout the decades of theories, we've, we've produced new content, new educational resources, and we had plans certainly to do something this year. So we're delighted to be able to work with, with Prony to bring that to bear this time. Uh, I'm going to talk you through just some of the stuff that we've done uh, and show some of the stuff that we've done. Um, and there's a chance, if you, if you wish, to, to get hands on some of the new resources that we've developed. And there'll also be, as you might have noticed, um, two new seats on the table at the front here as well. Uh, there's a short drama performance this afternoon too. So it's, it's all the stuff that we've, we've tried to, to correlate out, to, to combine and bring together to mark this centenary and, and to mark kind of some of the, the main people uh, involved in this centenary year. So one of the most important, or one of the, the main things we've done, certainly one of the most significant things we've done in recent years is to develop uh, new graphic novels and comic books about some of these key periods of time in, in our history. And we started out in uh, 2014 uh, and developed our first story around the Easter Rising and the Battle of the Somme. Um, and it was printed back to back. So you'll have noticed in your packs today there's a new publication. 
Um, so I help from me here. So it's the, as Leo said earlier, it's the Edith Lady Londonderry and Countess Markovich graphic novel. And with all of these graphic novels, we've printed them all back to back, and they all tend to to look at opposite sides, as it were, to, to different characters and different people from different sides and different different, different backgrounds. So the Easter Rising of Battle of the Somme was Winifred Kearney and uh, Billy McFadden. So we're looking at two people from uh, one from a Unionist uh, tradition, one from a Nationalist tradition, and printing those back to back. Uh, and even the act of doing that and then putting that into a young person's hand automatically allows them, if they haven't heard of one of those events before, to load them in, in roads and then point to be able to access and find out more information about that person, about that event. And we found that that's been tremendously successful in engaging new people and new audiences around this content and this time frame. And over, since 2014, we've printed upwards, I think, of 50 or 60,000 copies of these arising the Battle of the Psalm story, and it continues to be popular in terms of engaging young people. And not just young people, I keep saying young people, but I, I show these to my, to my parents who are in their 60s and their 70s, and they get a kick out of it, they get, they get to learn some new information that they wouldn't otherwise have. And we've also used them in adult learning education programs as well, and they continue to be successful for that. We followed that up with the Second of Lusitania, uh, then around Alice Milligan and Francis Ledwich, so literary characters from the time, and, and last year with the Battle of the Scene and uh, Kathleen Lynn. So again, taking uh, alternative viewpoints to the events of that time, um, kind of comparing and contrasting what was going on across Ireland and across Europe and throughout the world. Uh, and again, printed loads and loads of these copies and just gave them out to people for free and allowed them to access uh, and to learn. They're short, you'll notice from, from this new one that we have that they're short, very short stories. They're not intended to be an all-encompassing, this is the story of Countess Margaret's, because I'm not sure there's enough paper for that. <laughs> it's, it's an entry-level point, it's a chance for people to, to pick it up, to find out some basic information, some background information, and to go off and do their own research, and hopefully be encouraged to do so. And so with this new one, as I said, it's based around the lives of Countess Constance Markovich and Lady Edith, or Edith, Lady Londonderry. And two, two very significant characters, as uh, some of you might know, in terms of, of what they achieved and, and what their backgrounds were. We purposely didn't go for the, the kind of two people who, um, who would have been heavily involved in suffrage or suffragist acts. We wanted to sort of skirt around the, the, the edges of that and tell a wider story. So, although both of these characters were obviously involved quite heavily in, in some of those actions, uh, it, it sort of tells the wider story. So, in Edith Lady Londonderry, for example, it touches on mostly around her involvement with the Women's Legion and how she brought about change in that regard, and with Countess Markovich, how she was, how her sort of socialist leanings and socialist stance and it enabled her to, to um, the campaign for rights in other ways uh, for, uh, for the poor and the less well off as well as for women. Um, within these new comic books you'll see that there's some background information towards the back of each story and then there's also some uh, cross-curricular tasks and activities that can be completed in the classroom as well and all of the comic books that we've done, the previous ones here and these two new ones, have all been linked to the curriculum either at Key Stage 2 or Key Stage 3 so that automatically allows them to come to the hands of school children uh, and enables uh, young people to, or enables schools and teachers to be able to, to map these to the curriculum in some way and to make them relevant. So again, given that we're a creative media arts organisation, we do a lot of digital activities and digital stuff. These are mostly digital activities and digital stuff based uh, exercises within these comic books. Everything from creating a short film about Mount Stewart to imagining that you're creating a series of tweets about Mark election in 1918. So it encourages young people to, to use the kind of their, their modern day interpretations and the things that they're most used to uh, and apply it to history. Uh, and we found that that approach has, has worked really, really well. So we've done a small print run of these uh, just in the last few weeks and delivered them to some schools uh, and did some activities and some workshops, which I'll talk to you about in a little while as well, which kind of ties in to what we did with the, with the drama piece. Um, and the feedback's been really good. Um, most people, or, or certainly more people, will, will have known the story or have heard of Countess Margaret's before. Less people are around the story of Edith Lady London there. So, Within that, they're, they're, they're getting a chance, uh, by putting this, this, this resource into their hands, getting a chance to, to immediately start to, to learn new perspectives and, and new stories. I'm delighted to be able to work with the National Trust on this story, to bring this to life. So they've, they've provided lots of kind of archive and access and uh, materials that allow us to build this story. Uh, and we've also had a long-term relationship with the National Library of Ireland in Dublin, who've helped us with, with this story. 
uh, and they have copies of all of our comic books currently. Um, uh, I've distributed them through their World War Ireland exhibition in Dublin, uh, and they continue to be really popular and really successful. So the, the footprint's uh, ongoing. And if anybody would like to access any of these, what we're, we're planning to do during the year is to print uh, enough copies that we can send a pack of these comic books to every school across Northern Ireland. But if anybody would also like to access them for, for workshops and training programs or for their own benefit, uh, please get in touch. We can make that happen as well. Um, so what we've also been doing, uh, that's, that's one thing. I'm kind of going to whiz through all of this and hopefully you can ask me lots of questions and, and you can access and play around this content afterwards. Uh, over the decade of centenaries so far in, in commemoration, we've, we've also produced a suite of animations. And again, these are uh, appeal uh, to a new audience and allow new people to, to look at this time frame in a way that they, they couldn't otherwise have before. So you'll immediately see from, just from this screenshot that uh, we, we, we tend to use colour. So we're trying to present events from 100 years ago, doing so in a colourful way and in an informative way. We also use a method of, of as Leo said earlier, he couldn't understand 2.5D. Um, 2.5D parallax, which essentially brings um, old, it brings any image to life. In this regard, we bring old imagery to life. Old archive imagery, um, obviously there's not much video content from that time, so we're trying to, to, to do it in a new way. Uh, but it adds a fresh perspective to that content, and it allows people to be able to kind of get in um, and learn about these events in a short space of time. So since 2014, we've just uh, animations on the East Horizon, Battle of the Somme, the Battle of Messines, um, and other things that I've forgotten, start of the First World War. Lots of animations that, that kind of uh, allow new audiences to, to engage with it. Uh, I'm delighted to be, to be able to show this today. One of the, the first groups that people get to see this. Uh, and I want to say a special thank you to Margaret at the front. Margaret helped us out on, on the script with this and uh, on fact checking as well. So I'm going to play it. Uh, and we'll, we'll recap on some of the main points you've heard already today. I hope that isn't overkill, uh, but it'll do it in a, hopefully in a shorter time frame. Uh, and hopefully in an interesting way. <laughs> In 1918, as the First World War entered its final year, great changes were occurring throughout society. One of the most significant was women's struggle to achieve equality with men, and especially the right to vote. It had been a long campaign. In the early 1870s, Isabella Todd formed the North of Ireland Women's Suffrage Society, the first suffrage group in Ireland. The Belfast-based Todd spoke at large meetings to demand a better deal for women and, with her friend Margaret Byers, campaigned for girls' education at secondary and university level. Thomas and Anna Haslam later founded the first suffrage group in Dublin that would go on to become the Irish Women's Suffrage and Local Government Association. For decades, they campaigned for women to be given the vote in local and parliamentary elections. Because of Isabella Todd, Belfast agreed to allow women to elect members to the city corporation in 1887, long before the Local Government Act of 1898. Initially, the suffragists campaigning for the right to vote in parliamentary elections, like Millicent Fawcett's National Union of Women Suffrage Societies, chose legal methods, such as petitions, meetings, and letter writing, to advance their cause. But progress was slow. And in 1903, a more militant movement of women, known as suffragettes, emerged under the leadership of Emmeline Pankhurst. She and her daughters formed the Women's Social and Political Union and oversaw more direct tactics, such as mass meetings, heckling politicians, damaging public property, and chaining themselves to barriers at public places like Downing Street. The militant movement soon spread to Ireland where Hannah Sheehy Skeffington and Margaret Cousins set up the Irish Women's Franchise League in 1908, campaigning for home rule for Irish women, as well as Irish men. There were also 20 small non-militant suffrage groups around Dunster. The group Todd formed, now known as the Irish Women's Suffrage Society, had unionist, nationalist and labour women, and held open-air meetings and poster parades. Two of their members served prison sentences in Holloway Jail in London after joining the window smashing campaign of the WSPU. Eighteen Irish women were imprisoned in Holloway for suffrage activities. 
When the Irish Parliamentary Party refused to include votes for women in the third Home Rule Bill of 1912, the IWFL decided the time for militancy in Ireland had arrived. On June the 13th, members attacked the windows of Dublin Castle, the GPO and the Custom House, and all were arrested and sent to Montjoy Jail. In November 1912, the windows of the GPO in Belfast were smashed, telephone wires cut, and letters and pillar boxes destroyed. No one was arrested. At the end of 1913, the WSPU set up an Ulster Centre in Belfast, and members of the IWSS joined. They attacked buildings connected with the Ulster Unionists, and places of male recreation, like golf courses, and the Abilans Mansion, where members of the UBF were training. They hoped to persuade Unionists to give women the vote if Ulster opted out of home rule. In July 1914, in one of the most famous attacks, Lillian Bentke, a founding member of the Lisburn Suffrage Society, attempted to blow up Lisburn Cathedral, along with three other women. Seven suffragettes were imprisoned in Conlon Road Jail, and there were 36 arrests for suffrage activity throughout Ireland. When the First World War was declared, many suffragettes ended their campaign, turning attentions to the war effort. Lady Londonderry's Women's Legion, for instance, showed for the first time that women were the equal to men in roles from driver to engineer and farm worker. In Ireland, however, many suffragettes, like Sheep Skeleton, campaigned against the war and continued their fight for women's rights such as equal pay for equal work and equal marriage laws. She and other female Republicans, like Winifred Carney and Countess Constance Markovich, believed in the promise of the proclamation of the Irish Republic and took part in the Easter Rising of 1916. When victory came in the battle for the vote, it was qualified because politicians were afraid women would be in the majority as voters. The Representation of the People Act in February 1918 extended voting rights to women over the age of 30 who were property owners, married to property owners, or living in rental property worth more than five pounds. This meant that many young women who had taken part in war work still could not vote. All men aged 21 and over could vote without any property qualification. Women now formed 43% of the electorate. In November, a Qualification of Women Act also allowed women over 21 to stand for election. 17 women in Britain stood in the 1918 general election. None were successful. In Ireland, Sinn Féin put up two women candidates. In East Belfast, Winfrey Carney, who worked for the Irish Textile Workers Union and who had served in the GPO during the Easter Rising, was unsuccessful. Countess Markovic in Dublin became the first woman ever elected to the House of Commons. As a Sinn Féin member, she did not take her seat, but was made Minister for Labour in the first dawn when released from prison in March 1919. In Ireland, voting rights were extended to all women over the age of 21 by the Free State Constitution drawn up in 1922. In Britain, Full voting rights were extended to women aged over 21 by the Equal Franchise Act introduced in 1928. It had been a remarkable achievement, but much work was left for women in Ireland. Not long before her death in 1946, Sheehy Skeffington expressed her disillusionment with the Irish Republic's treatment of women. The fight goes on today. So that animation is that new and that fresh that the, the music we've been featuring it haven't, haven't actually bought the copyright to yet. So that's why the, you hear that watermark. Um, but that and those animations are a way for us to be able to, to set the context and set the scene for an, an important event or an important period of history like uh, the suffrage movement uh, within uh, what uh, about seven minutes. So within seven minutes we're able to use that in, in classrooms and conferences and at events. Uh, and immediately sets up and gives people an understanding or a brief insight into what those events are uh, and what they can be. Uh, and that animation will be finalised uh, and made available online in the coming weeks as well, uh, free, to, free to view and free to use anybody who would like to do so. One of the other things that we've been sort of most heavily involved in working with Prony on recently is uh, a repurposing of a resource that Prony had made a few years ago. 
Um, you'll notice that this is all done on an iPad, and this is a new iPad resource that we've made for Prony Stand Up and Be Counted uh, Education Pack, which was made a few years ago. How many years ago? 2014? Okay, so about four years ago. Um, and the content's rich, the content's really good, it makes use of Prony's archival material, it's a great use, and you can still access that, that resource online. Um, and key to it is, is the kind of archive content that, that it includes. So what we've done is applied that, or applied iPad technology, or iBook technology, um, to, to recreate and repurpose that content. And this resource will also be available um, uh, from the Apple iBook store in the coming weeks. We're doing some final tinkering and, and tailoring to it over the, over the next few weeks. And it'll be available for free uh, for any iPad and iPhone users. And it works like an interactive resource would. So again, given the, the, the prominence of technology in schools, we're trying to produce new resources that can be used um, quickly uh, and effectively in, in learning environments. So you get a little bit of a section to start off with about what this resource is. As you scroll through, again, an introduction to what the content is. Um, there's a suffrage timeline, which if you click on each of these individual pages, you can start to be able to see content. So it starts a bit like, like Lynn was talking, right all the way back to 1832. And by tapping on each of these, you're getting a, an immersive, kind of interactive experience about what each of these years had in store. Uh, and all the way through, <coughs> excuse me, you can tap on each of these to find out more information about the key events and, and key moments from history from that time. And it goes all the way right through until about 1928. I won't touch every single button, um, but you, you, can, you can do that yourself afterwards. I have brought along some iPads today. I tend not to get them out at the start of the session because then we would get them back afterwards. They've all come into handbags and rucksacks. <laughs> and we would get them back. I'm only joking, that's never happened. But I have brought some along today that you can, you can access and see this resource for yourself. Uh, following the timeline, well, the way we've broken it down is there's two distinct chapters. Excuse me. So there's suffrage and political perspectives, and then suffrage and society. Uh, anybody who's used an iPad before will be able to very quickly pick up on this. But within each of those chapters, it's broken down into subsections, uh, which had been done in the original resource. So under suffrage and political perspectives, for example, the first section within that is Europe and Ireland in the 19th century. And you'll see right throughout that we've tried to use as much of this really nice um, ar archive imagery from Prony as possible. So it sets up with a little bit of context, a little bit of information. All of the images in, in an iBook in this uh, capacity are all interactive in a certain way, so they're all clickable and scalable. And we've included images all the way right throughout that apply to the various sections. Moving on to the likes of Home Rule, for example. Um, Mark, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but you're in some of these videos. <laughs> so these are videos from a few years ago um, that the, as part of the CRC's lecture series. Uh, so again, in, in trying to make this more interactive and trying to make it much more informative and engaging for, for viewers uh, and listeners, what we can do is embed video content in here. I was wondering, um, in your research, did you come across any... So all the way right throughout, there's these little kind of video stop points oh, so that um, to sort of brings, uh, brings to life uh, whatever the, the topic is. So it just so happened that this, this video lecture series covered a lot of the key points that the interactive iBook did. So you can it's actually go in, uh, and if you really want to, you can hear Margaret speaking all over again. So she's always, and then she's And why would you not want to do that? <laughs> uh, and then right throughout as well, uh, again, galleries of images relating to all of this content. So this is um, a book <coughs> of the UWC Executive Committee that Crony hold in their collections. What we've done here is as well as the actual uh, content, which you can go in, uh, and view and read in great detail yourselves. There are also some tasks and some suggested activities that we've put in uh, along with all of this, again, to make it much more relevant in the classroom and in learning environments. So for example, study the entry in the minute book above, form into small groups in the class, and discuss which of the grounds youth played women in the UWC were most worried about, which is a spelling mistake there, if home rule were implemented, and do you think the suggestions would have been taken seriously. So again, all the way right throughout, it's Yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a chance to go in and, and to read about this content, but in the classroom, by being able to suggest tasks like that, it makes it much more relevant to young people. And again, right through, you notice little kind of question points. Again, there's some research and discovery tasks that can be done in the classroom. This one, for example, uh, finding facts out about uh, the, how the lives of women changed as a result of the First World War. Uh, so again, trying to make that as, as as, as fun and rewarding as an experience as possible for, for young people and for students. I won't go through every single page, you'll be glad to hear. Uh, again, you'll notice what we've tried to do with, with making it much more interactive all the way throughout. 
but if you, anybody would like to, they can come up and grab my pad afterwards and see this for themselves. But as I say, all the way through, and it starts to look at suffrage and society, everything from women and labour relations to the development of the suffrage campaign, and again, all the way right through, you notice this great archive content that's, that's been maybe haven't been easily accessible before, it's much more accessible now, uh, and there's a real chance to, to, get it, to get stuck in and to delve into it in much more detail. There's a little bit section at the end as well. So that's a whistle stop tour of the iBook, and as I say, it will be available from uh, the Apple iBook store towards the end of the summer. Uh, so again, another chance to, to see something very fresh today. Uh, one of the other things that we've been doing in, in recent weeks and months is working with, uh, with Kibosh Theatre Company. And Kibosh are a theatre company based in Belfast. And they, um, we, we, we sort of sent them a brief that we have this new comic book on Quintus Markovich and Lady Londonderry. And we'd love to, to see if it's possible to create a new drama piece about that. So Kibosh went off uh, and, and developed. Uh, scripted, wrote, uh, researched, and developed their own kind of artistic interpretation of that. Um, and it's a meeting of Countess Markovich and Lady London Jerry, which we're pretty sure didn't happen. I'm not sure if anybody else can correct us on that. We're pretty sure it didn't happen. So it's, it's very much fiction, it's very much uh, an artistic response. And the reason we did this was, again, in trying to make this uh, much more accessible for, for young people, we wanted to take this around some schools uh, as a way to launch the new comic book but also as a way to be able to engage students uh, around that. And it touches, the drama piece touches on everything from home rule to partition, which is covered uh, at, at the key stage three curriculum. Uh, and it draws on other real life characters as well. So you'll notice that there's some people throughout whose names you might recognize, but that was a, a, almost a way to make it much more recognizable for young people as well. Um, so as I say, Kibosh went off, researched, scripted, uh, and developed this new piece. We then took it out to the schools across Belfast and Derry just a few weeks ago, um, and to, to actually to really great response. Um, you're always apprehensive. Children can sometimes be the worst critics, um, but they all really um, engage with it. It's a, it's a short piece that lasts about 15 or 20 minutes, but they all really engage with it, and we're able to learn we hope, uh, some new facts about both characters. And again, uh, we find that while most people would have, or more, more people would have known the Markovich story or known off Markovich. If you're new uh, of Lady London there, so it was a chance for us to, to sort of uh, talk about you know the kind of things like the Women's Legion that they might not have heard of before, uh, and some of the things that Lady London there was involved in. Uh, there was, the school's response was fantastic. We finished each day in, uh, in an all boys school. We, we tried to do like a mix of, of all boys, all girls, integrated schools.